All righty. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's, you know, it's been a pretty long week so far. I don't know about you guys. I'm, I'm still kind of tired after last night. So thank, thanks for making it. One more session after this. So hope you guys had a good time. Hope you enjoy your, this session and the next one. My name is Chris Kalusak, and we're here for Design to Visualization. How to make virtual reality a reality at your design firm. Reading that out loud here in front of all of you, I probably could have shortened the title a little bit just to make it easier for myself. Um, but hey, what are you going to do? So let's get this started. So what we're going to go over here really is kind of 40,000 feet up. We're going to look at uh, virtual reality. We're going to look at the design process. We're going to look at some of the hardware and software that's currently available to you all. We're going to look at you know, what we've done at Taylor Design in the past, what we're doing currently. And then we're going to go over a little bit of model management because for me, virtual reality isn't just about virtual reality. I want to tie it into the design documentation process. So managing your models is super important. So a little about me. Like I said, my name's Chris Kalusak. I'm from Taylor Little Design. Uh, I graduated from Roger Williams University with a Bachelor of Science in Architecture. Got my master's at the Academy of Art in San Francisco. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm into a lot of things. I'm into architecture. I do a lot of digital fabrication, robotics. Uh, you can all read it there. Follow me on Twitter if you guys want. I just started it up actually like five, six days ago. So I don't have a lot of posts. I don't have a lot of followers, so it'd be cool. Um, I'm going to start posting a lot more though. And I've had a lot of fun and kind of seeing what everybody else is posting on there and starting to follow you guys back and seeing what the community is doing. So Taylor Design, who are we? We are a multidisciplinary design firm. We do architectural design, we do interior design, and we do design strategy. We're based out of Irvine, California. We have a San Diego, a San Francisco office. We're about 70 employees, maybe 80 now, 100% ESOP, so that's kind of cool. And we really do a lot of healthcare, science, tech, education, and senior living. We're almost 40 years old too, which is pretty cool. I haven't been there that long, but it's going to be cool to, uh, to celebrate that. So what we're all here for is virtual reality. So obviously, we have our learning objectives. By the end of this course, I really want you to have an understanding on how to utilize virtual reality for the design and the documentation process. I want you to be able to create a plan for implementing this at your firm. I want you to be able to identify the best direction based off of the technology requirements and what you currently have in-house. And I want you to at least have a, a better understanding, and I'm sure you all have a pretty good understanding, but at least how I see a good understanding of model management for virtual reality. And there's one in here that I didn't put here, and I really want you guys to be able to go back home and have fun. That's really what it's about. It's about an experience in the virtual space. It's about exciting your users. It's about exciting yourself. It's about exciting your clients with something that they possibly haven't seen before. So it, it, it really is about having fun. So where does it all start? You know, there's so many different ways to start going about virtual reality. There's so many possibilities. You have authoring software from Max, Revit, um, you have SketchUp, you have Rhino, you, there's so many out there. You have companies like Fuser, Enscape, Iris, Unity, Unreal, that are starting to get into it. If hardware manufacturers from Dell, HP, Microsoft, Asus, HTC, you know, Facebook with the Oculus, there's, there's just a lot out there right now. So what, where do we start? So we're really going to start by looking at and examining ourselves. What do we want out of this? Do we want a photorealistic environment or at least an ultra-realistic? Getting photoreal in VR is still something that's pretty hard to do. Or do we want something more abstract? Do we want to show volume? Do you want to show lighting without having to deal with your client nitpicking on your materials when you're two weeks into the project and you want them to understand the space and the spatial quality of what they're going to get? Do you want a mobile or tethered environment? This is, this is kind of important. Do you want this to be something that you could use for marketing, you can give away? Do you want this to be something that is just a powerhouse? And that has to do partially with the first option. Is it deliverable or is it workflow based? So is it offline or is it real time? This is actually really important. This is really what drives me and 
what, what excites me because we're, we're now at the point in society where we can use virtual reality as a workflow-based software. We could be running in a VR environment while we're modeling in Revit, syncing back and forth, not having to redo work, and then we can export it out and have that offline deliverable model at the end. And then always, just like everything else in what we do, there is a budget constraint. So, you know, it's never fun to talk about money with these, but th there is a budget constraint. What can you afford to do? Can you outs do you outsource it? Does it cost a lot of money? Do you insource it? Do you have the environment you need at work currently, or do you need to invest in new technology, new computers to really make it happen? And then goes away, uh, goes with the others. Is it in something for internal use? or is it a takeaway? So you can put your designers in it, you can go in it, or do you give it to the client? Do you give it to prospective clients? Do you give it to people at job fairs to take back and to see your work? So those are all, you know, they're, they're not all the directions that you can go in, but they are some, and those are the ones that I like to think about when I'm trying to kind of dictate and decide which way we want to go on what project, and especially when we started off at Taylor Design, the decisions we had to make were driven by these facts, or factors, sorry about that. So, got some more questions. And these questions really have to do with identifying your users, their software, that, and their workflows. This is important. You don't want to put any more pressure on your users to do something new. If you make this easy for them, they will adopt it. They will get in it. They will be excited about it. You know, if you make them spend weeks and weeks and weeks learning new software to do it, they're not going to get ex as excited about it. It's going to be harder to implement. And really, what do you gain out of that besides getting frustrated users? Not much. And nobody wants a frustrated user. You don't want your, your people doing the modeling, creating the environments to be frustrated. You're not going to get a higher quality of work out of there. So how many users do you want to put in this? You have a team of one working on virtual reality. You have a team of 10. You have 20. It's a scale of economy for your company. So how many users do you want to use? Do you want to have a dedicated workstation? Or do you want multiple? Uh, currently, we have a few people that have been dabbling with visualization, with virtual reality, and we have about four machines that are available for them to use. And it, it works, unless if everybody has a deadline at the same time, and it's really hard, and you have to worry about scheduling it out, and that's never fun. You don't want that to be a constraint when going into virtual reality. It's just scheduling your resources. That's no fun. What authoring software do you use? You need something that is going to work with your authoring software, because you don't want your users to have to rebuild everything. You don't want to have to go from, let's say, a SketchUp to a Revit to a Max and rebuild it every time. That doesn't make any sense. And luckily, we don't have to do that anymore. What visualization software do you currently use? There's a ton out there, right? You can render in Revit. You can use cloud rendering. You can use things like Lumion. You can use things like Enscape. You can go out of house. Um, there, there's, just, there's so much. So, what do you currently use? What does that workflow look like? And do you want this workflow to replace it or to augment it and just actually make it better? Do you have the infrastructure you need currently to support VR development? So that's computers, that's headsets, and that's also kind of people, right? Like we, don't like, we don't really think of our users as infrastructure, but in the way they are in this case, because you need to have, you need to have people to do the work. So either you need to acquire more people to do the work, you have to train the people you have, or if you're lucky, you have people that know visualization, that understand virtual reality, and that can jump in on day one. And maybe that's you guys. Maybe it's you in the audience. You know, we have, uh, I'm lucky I have our BIM manager here, Steve, and he, he gets in it with us. He's in there having fun, and that's what's important. He doesn't have to go in there and do it, but he does. And then we have people that just starting off in interns, and they like to get in it and play with it. So what... There's no level that somebody can't get into VR and learn to model in it, learn to upgrade, update everything, and just have a good time. And then the final one again, how do you plan on using this? You plan on using it during the design process for design, for presentations, for marketing, for clients to take away. What are you really trying to get out of it? So we're going to talk about software. Before we really get into the different software that we use and what's out there, we're going to look about, a little bit at the design process, um, at least how, how I see the design process and, I've had it process. and I've had the chance to talk to some people this week 
and explain what I'm, what I'm talking about with it, and they, they agree with me from different disciplines, you know, it's not, this is not the design process. Like, this is my take on what the design process is. If you were at the keynote today, you saw a take on what the design and documentation and construction process was, and it was insane. Um, so I simplified it. So let, let's see what we got. So what do we th actually think this looks like? Project starts up. You're not going to do work unless a project starts up, right? Design collaboration. You have a few people together. You come up with some concepts. You figure out what's going to happen. You do some pre-visualization. This could be just sketch up. This could be hidden lines, shaded views. You're not pouring all your resources in it at this point because you may have three or you might have 20 options. You don't know. You can't, you can't spend $5,000 on a rendering if you have 20 options in the beginning of a project. That doesn't make any sense. You get approval to go ahead with the design. You get into the documentation process. You get into the actual visualization process. We are producing those high-end images to really sell the client, where they're able to use those for marketing. You know, guys know what those are. You get sign-off, and then what are we all here for? We actually build things, right? We design and we build things. At the end of the day, we need to get something built. So, you know, that, that's a pretty linear concept of what the design process could be. But is that what it actually is? So what, what, what does it actually look like? The beginning's the same. We go through project startup. We have those collaboration meetings. We do previs. We get design approval. And we start documentation. This is where it gets interesting. And what really happens, the majority of the time, I find, is we create fragments. We don't intend to create fragments, but we do. We have people that are pulling your Revit model that's using for documentation development into things like SketchUp, into Macs, into other software, continuing to develop different schemes for different things. So are they adding different lighting? Are they adding materials, furniture layout? Hopefully, they're not moving walls and other major elements on you, because that would just be horrible. But you have them do this work. They document it. They visualize it sometimes. You know, it happens, it keeps happening, it happens for multiple people multiple times. And you have to pull all of that back in to your documentation process at the end. So not only did they go through and do all that work, as you're continuing to develop and document your project, you now have to redo all the work they just did to get it back in. And that is horrible. That is such a waste of time, energy, and money. And you don't want to waste that. You want to have better profit, right? And then the end's the same. You do visualization, you get sign off, and we build it. So what could it look like? And we, there are solutions out there to make this happen. And if, you know, in a, in a perfect world, you don't have people fragmenting your models. You have people to continuing to develop, maybe through design options and Revit, maybe through different work sets. But you, you have it all within one you know, single truth model. But so what could it look like? Same first steps. That's going to be there again. Documentation comes along. And instead of creating fragments, we're creating these tangentials that actually loop back into that documentation model. There's software out there like Fuser and Enscape and Revit Live, if you use it correctly, that allow you to actually develop these different schemes, work on things, be adding materials in virtual reality, be looking at design options, do your renderings, do your VR environments, and pull it right back into the documentation. Unbelievable, right? It's it's something that we haven't really had in the past. It does take some training to get people to understand how that works. But what it does, it affords you extra time to do your documentation, because you know you're not going to have to do it twice. You're not going to have to do the rework. They're working in a, essentially a, a, uh, a common data environment. right? They're, they're able to export that data, export. It's not really exporting. It's just porting it over to another screen, another program, that links it back in at the end, which is amazing. And then visualization, sign off, and construction. So that's really what I see the future of the design process kind of going into, is not creating these fragments, but creating this loop, this loop that allows us to do iteration, to do studies with things like materials, layouts, put it actually in the visualization side, and then loop it right back in, and not having to do any rework. And to me, that, that's the future of what we're going to be doing. So back to some of those questions, you know, 
your authoring software, are you planning on hiring, and then really what your desired end product is. Like I said before, there's plenty of products out there for authoring. You have Revit, you have Rhino, you have Mac, SketchUp, you have Formit, Archicad, you know, uh, MicroStation, you have Bentley. There, there's a ton of them out there right now. There's a ton of them. And in the ideal world, you don't need to be tied down to one. This, this process is going to work for pretty much anything because it's a, it's a concept. It, it's an idea. It's the way you do things. It, it's not a software or hardware limitation. And then you can bring them into things, like I said, Stingray or 3DS Interactive, Max Interactive, as it's called now, Fuser, Unity Unreal, Enscape, Iris. There's a ton of them out there. So Fuser. What is Fuser? Fuser is it's probably one of my favorites, the one I've spent the most time in in the past few years. What it does is it gives you a chance to have an interoperability with Revit. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing just somebody actually in VR moving that chair around. It allows for bi-directional data. And that I know they were one of the first on the market to do this. So basically, I can be working in the Revit model and the Fuser model. I right, have somebody else in the Fuser model. I can be making changes in Revit. They're updating the Fuser model. I could also be making changes in Fuser, and I can push and pull all that data right back into Revit without having to redo it. What that allows me to do is quickly iterate, quickly see how that's going to affect my design, and update my construction documents right away. Update my documentation, allow me to really do that loop, to have that iteration without creating more work for myself. The extra work I'm creating is hitting a button to say, yeah, pull this data back. That's a hell of a lot better than having to go through and redo everything that I just did in another program. Works on small and large projects, which is really nice. It's just the way that it's, so it's a game engine. So it allows you to bring in polys, allows you to bring different models, link different models in, and just optimizes it within itself. Um, this is, you know, it's a fairly large project that they gave me a, a shot of, thankfully. Um, and you can see they're, they're pretty far zoomed out on it, but you can get down, you can walk around it, you can, you can kind of play the god mode, bird's eye, rotate it around, really see what's going on. Allows you go through initial concepts through construction documents. So what I mean by that is before when we talked about that photorealistic versus abstract, you can load your model in on day one and you can have it as like a museum board type rendering where you have, you have light qualities, but really what you're trying to get out of it is spatial. You're trying to let somebody understand the space that you're going to provide them. You let them experience that space. As you develop the model more, you start to actually include your materials into it you can start to get more of an abstract, more of a rendered, and then they call it ultra realistic. They don't call it photorealistic because they don't want to call it something that it's not. And I think that's great. Um, and you can see all those views both on just the screen and in the VR headset. It expands beyond. So it expands into four-dimensional data. So you can tie in your P6 projects, other scheduling into it, and in virtual reality, do clash detections and do construction and sequencing animations, all in virtual reality as you walk around your site, inspecting the elements that are being built as if you were there watching them be built. And that's something we personally don't use a lot, but we have played a lot, uh, a lot with. And it's really interesting to actually watch your building go up in front of you bef months, years before your building actually goes up in front of you. Um, allows you to change the time of day. You can do measurements, markups. They have a collaboration mode, so you can have people in different parts of the world in the same model at the same time. Has a chaperone mode, they call it, where you know you might not be at the point where you want your client just you know to haphazardly walk around and go like this and find some little detailing that you didn't do on your model yet. So you could actually drive them through the model and allow them to look. So you're getting them to focus on a path that you predetermine, but still kind of experience what's going around them, put them in their field of presence of their project. And that's huge. I thought I animated all those. That's sad. Uh, well, Enscape. <laughs> Enscape goes about it a different way. Enscape goes about trying to create a really high quality image. Um, it runs within the Revit program, so instead of like Fuser where you pop up the instance and it's essentially another program that launches, it acts just as another Revit window. You can minimize it, 
can ex make it full screen, you can do whatever you want, you can tile it within there, and it runs as a native Rendifit window, and that's pretty cool. It allows for a rapid, uh, high-end visualization, so as, as you see, this is a, it's a pretty well-rendered model. It's, you know, it's not, it's not photorealistic, but it's, it's getting to the higher end of the spectrum in terms of reflections and other things that are going on. It's a single-click solution, just like Fuser, that allows you one click into this environment, takes all the data in your model, pulls it in. Both of these allow you to access that BIM data right away. So Fuser allows you to access it within Fuser, allows to access it within the mobile app and the executables you can create afterwards. So it's, it's actually kind of pretty cool. You can give your client just the executable so they're not working in the model and they're not changing things on you, but they can still experience it. You can publish it through Fuser Mobile and they can go into it. This does a sim similar thing. You export it essentially as an EXE for your client to go into when you're ready for your client to go into it. Once so again, works from start to finish. That's kind of important, I think. If, if you have a tool that only works during certain phases of your project, and then you have to buy another tool for the other phases, does it really make sense? And it allows you to manage all your data directly within Revit. You don't need to teach users how to assign materials in a new way. You don't need to teach users how to move objects, place families. It's all done within Revit natively. Li or Revit Live and 3ds Max Interactive, um, previously Autodesk Live and Stingray. <coughs> so again, it's a single-click export from Revit, which that's kind of the common theme here. Minimal steps to get your model out into that environment. You don't want to have to do a lot of work to get it there. Uploads into the cloud, does some churning depending on the size of your project, takes so long, it allows you to download it. Has a free viewer, so your, cl your client, your other users, they don't need to buy anything. You just have them install an app on their computer. They can view it. You have the editor on your computer, which is a Revit Live editor or 3DS Interactive, depending on how much time and what you want out of it. It's a full-on game engine. So that's where it gets really fun. You can now take this model that you turned up in a few minutes from your Revit model. You can open it up. A live file is a zip file, essentially, so you can pull that out. You can open it in 3DS Interactive, and you could say, you know what? When you go through these doors, I want the lights to turn on, I want the fan to start. And you can set switches like that. You can actually animate it, almost turn it into a game, turn it into an experience for your client, where they're not just walking around and looking at the space, they actually get to experience the space. Um, and then, like I said, it's a downloadable zip file. So what this doesn't do, that fuser, and Enscape do is it's not like that to get your new data into it. You actually just up, re upload your model. When it downloads, you pull that asset, which is you know, a fancy term for the model in Game Talk, back into 3ds Interactive. Like you essentially just overwrite the old one, and you have all your animations, all that extra work you put into it already available for you. You can then save out those animations, those cues, those toggles by themselves to put into other projects. So you're not constantly redeveloping the wheel every time. So it really allows you to have an iterative-based workflow and create a library of kind of VR content and assets for you to use. This is a shot of 3DS Interactive. You can see the camera. You see, you know, you have a, a gizmo. Pretty much every software has gizmos nowadays. You see your lights. It's, it looks like a game engine. It's really cool all your BIM data gets ported over. So when you click on an object, you can see all your parameters that are assigned to that object. You can go through, you can modify them there. So it, it, it preserves data, which that's, that's kind of been a big talk here this year is you know, making sure you're preserving data, making sure data can go multiple directions, making sure you can pull it from one thing to another. It preserves your data. So all three examples, very quick, very iterative based, and allow you to preserve your data. Which, which is pretty important, right? I think so. <clears throat> so those are the three pieces of software that we currently use. I've dabbled in a few other ones, but I don't have, I don't have the expertise to really talk about them. There's been other talks from other software. You've seen stuff at Unreal. You've seen Iris here. They're all great. I just haven't had the expertise and the time to get into it, so I didn't want to kind of explain what they are. I'm sure you guys saw them on the floor or saw a class on them. So model management. 
Model management's a fun one. We all, model, or we all manage our models a little differently. That's the great thing. There isn't a right way to do this, right? But these are my recommendations based off of doing quite a few years of visualization and pretty much out of Revit has always been my modeler. I've used Max, Rhino, Maya, but Revit's, Revit's been my, my building modeler. So what do we have? We have assets. What are assets? And especially when you start getting into 3DS Interactive, an asset is a model, it's a family. Just don't think of it as anything extra. Don't, don't freak out. I have some people that look at, what's an asset? I don't know. It's a component. It's all good. Um, we're going to go over linked models a little bit, work sets, poly counts, all things that I'm sure you guys experience and work with every day, even if you don't realize it. So model management assets. So asset management is huge for us, um, not just for VR, but for all the content that we have. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of Avail. This is our content management system that we use. Um, if, I don't know if you guys saw them down on the floor, but what it essentially is is a content agnostic, and that's the biggest part. It's content agnostic content management. So I have Revit files in here. I have Dynamo scripts in here. I can put VR assets. I can put PDFs, videos, Word documents. You name it, you can put it in here which allows fast, rapid access to all of your, for all of your users to find their data. So it's, a, it's basically a very visual Windows Explorer, and you just make things easy for people to find. I really enjoy using this. Uh, it allows some filtering. It ties directly into Revit through a plugin. They're, uh, they're working on some other direct integrations, but at least for the other ones, you can still find your content and drag and drop it into the software that you need to put it in. So it makes life very easy. Polycount. So we know polycount is like the number one thing that kills our Revit models usually. We have, you know, I've brought in families of a chair, like, like this chair, and you can have a couple thousand polys, or you can have like 50 polys less, and what do you really want? What do you need? I don't know. Depends, right? So keep an eye on your polycount is important. Part of the reason I use a veil and I really care about polycount is I have, I can have multiple instances of those families, so I can have, you know, a high poly and a low poly have them next to each other and see what's there, and decide on what the right one is for the time. So very simple concepts of poly count, right? You have a cube, keep subdividing it, and subdividing it. Creates more data, takes longer to render, takes longer to refresh your frame rates on, in Revit, which becomes a real pain. So maintaining your poly count, especially within Revit, but not dumbing it down so much that you can't use it in at least a basic VR environment is, is important. Unless if you really like that like, super low poly look, which I'm sure all of you have seen, where they just distort everything. And there is that little fad, but it's nothing special. Model management, work sets and linked models. So coming from poly count and into work sets and linked models, this is where it gets fun, I think. So what we currently do, we use work sets for basically everything. We, every link we put into our Revit file is on its own work set to allow us to control it. Makes life very easy. It also means when I want to put VR assets in, these super high poly, pretty heavy models, these families that, you know, they could be, you could have a bed and you could have it modeled in Max or whatever your software is, and it could look soft. It could look like something you actually want to go lay down on compared to the, your, your Revit beds that look like metal, cardboard, and just look like they'd hurt. Um, so you, you create, a, create a work set. You have it closed. You don't have it visible in all your views. And you just toggle it on and off when you need it. And then when you need to export, you turn it on when you need to go into VR. So it's, it, that, that's one of the tricks that I've been using lately to really help manage our projects when it comes to file size and performance. You don't want a lagging Revit project just because you want to go to VR. That doesn't really make sense, right? You still, at the end of the day, have to do all the documentation. You also don't want to have to do all this extra work in another piece of software and then update later. So you have to find a middle ground. This works for us. It might not work for you. Um, the number one thing I really like to think about this topic is that there isn't one right answer. You know, I hope to hear from you guys. We'll have a, I'm going to make sure we have some time for Q&A. Um, and then even afterwards, I want to hear from you guys what you guys are doing to manage your models. Because I can guarantee you, 
I'm hoping you're all learning from me, but I can guarantee you I'll learn something from you as well. You have to have one chart and a PowerPoint. I'm a firm believer of that. Uh, this is market share as of early fall, approximate. So you have that. Once again, and I kind of went through a little fast, so I'm hoping we have some t topics we want to talk about. Um, I hope you did, were able to have an understanding by now of kind of what we've done and how you can start to implement virtual reality into your design, documentation, and construction processes. I hope you're able to kind of go home and come up with a plan at least of how to start going about this at your firm. I hope you're able to de decide which is the best way to go, at least at first, right? You can go abstract at first and go photo real later, or ultra real, you can go you know, really realistic and then go abstract later, and you, you could do it all, but my advice would be don't just jump into everything. Start, start small. And then I hope the little bit of uh, model management kind of helped or will help you guys when you start getting into really putting your assets in and seeing how you can work through virtual reality with a Revit file as your base. Because I'm sure a lot of you do use Revit as your main authoring software, being at Autodesk University. And then I kind of want to leave with this. Experience your models. Have fun in your models. Get people in there. You know, this is our conf one of our conference rooms with some of our users in there. And you get people doing some crazy things when they're in VR because they actually feel like they're there. I hope you've all had a chance to get into uh, your own VR environment or maybe one on the floor over the past few days. Uh, if not, I do have, everybody here has a flash drive, hopefully, with the little you know, adult fidget spinner marketing card that I made. Well, I didn't make it myself, but we made it at Taylor Design for you all. And that has uh, two VR models on it, one from Revit Live, one from Fuser. And I also have QR codes and all the documentation for the downloads for that, as well as the Fuser Mobile experience for you to try out afterwards if you want. So the Fuser Mobile is great because if you don't have a headset, you can download it, install it on your Android iOS or iOS, put it in cardboard, or use it as a phone, and you can actually use your fingers to control and navigate through the model. And it's pretty cool. So if you haven't been in VR yet, I at least encourage you to go and check out Fuser Mobile download the app that's up on there. It's uh, just QR through Google Drive and play and have fun and see what it is. And hopefully you get to experience it and have fun. So once again, just, you know, first time in the headset, getting explained how to use the controllers. And he's having a great time. And you know, we weren't staging these photos. We were walking around just taking pictures. And you catch moments like this where people are actually having a great time in VR. You also have people that don't have a great time and, you know, they mean to teleport somewhere and they end up standing on top of that table and they kind of like, they go like this because they don't know what to do or they teleport high and they think they're hitting their head on a duct or a structural beam or in their ceiling and it gets really funny. Uh, if you have a, a, an uneasy stomach for stuff like this, I would not recommend walking to the edge of something in VR and looking down. You will feel like you're up that high. The, the, the sense of presence in the environment is amazing. Uh, but if you don't have a weak stomach, do it. It's fun. <laughs> Once again, just kind of another one of our users getting in there and having fun experiencing the model. All the users that you saw here haven't actually, they didn't work on this project yet. So this was our working model, but they haven't worked on this project. So I, I brought it, I was able to bring our working Revit model in through Fuser and put them into it and let them experience it for the first time. So once again, I'm Chris Kalusak. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we have actually a lot of time left, because I, I speak really fast, I guess, and I had it timed out yesterday to about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and it didn't work. Question back there, can you come up to the microphone up front? Sure. Which means I get to take a break and have a sip of water. Your first time speaking? It is my first time speaking. Let's give this guy a round of applause. He got live stream on his shirt. Good job. Good job, Chris. Um, I was just wondering, what's, what's your like, number one takeaway from uh, VR and, and doing all this? What's the one thing that, you can, that stands out in your mind that avoid this or I uh, had a really good experience with that? Is there anything that you can think of? So based off of my experiences with VR, and it's, I've been working with it for about five years now, um, my number one takeaway is just make sure you're having fun. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> have fun with it. Like, if, if you're not having fun, you're, you're probably doing something wrong because it's really fun. Don't overload your models, but get in there, have fun. Uh, there's some really cool programs out there. Tilt Brush is amazing. So Tilt Brush is a program that actually allows you to, with your controllers in the Vive and the Oculus, just start painting into the air in, com in a complete virtual environment. So you're modeling things, you're painting. You can, you can go like this and blow it up, and then you can scale it back down. So go into your models and have fun, but also get stuff like Tilt Brush. Or I don't know if you guys ever played Portal before, but there's a Portal game where you actually like teleport around, and it's like a puzzle-finding game. And it's, just, it's really fun to do stuff like that in VR, because you don't have the same physics, and there's no reason to. You can do things in, that you can do in VR that you can't do in the real world, and it, it makes it fun. So don't be afraid to break the rules. Yeah, a bit. don't be afraid to break the rules. Very cool. Rules are meant to be broken sometimes. As, as you guys see, just head out up. So one of the questions that we've had is, how are you managing this with clients and not having them dive down into the weeds too much to try and keep everybody on task about like, okay, maybe this isn't really about the VR experience, maybe this is really about the building and yep. the building model. So I would say a lot of it has to come down with how you render that model. So yes, we can create a gorgeous environment for them to go through, and yes, eventually at some point you should, but how, my, my advice to how you kind of manage the client within it is start them off in an abstract space Put them in there, and if you have the option of going collaborative and being in there with them, do it. Because what it does is allows them to see what you're doing, what you're looking at, kind of guides them to do the same thing without going crazy. So you, know, you don't want your client going like this and like checking things out down there, but you want them to have the feel for the space that they're in at least in the beginning. And then you know, once you build that with the client, you get them looking at the things you want them to look at, next step, go more uh, detailed, go more detailed. The next project you have with them, you've already gone through it. You can start a little higher if you want, but really talk to them about what they want to see. You know, if you're really early on in the project, m even just massing on a site is really powerful. You, know, you could be doing a tower, and you can show them an image of the tower on the screen, and they don't understand how tall it is. But when you put them next to it, and you want them to feel how grand their building is going to be, how monumental that is, and they go like this, and they look up, and they're like, man, that is tall. So it's really just managing what you show them. Does that, that answer your question? Cool. As you guys go, I know we, there's a few up front, and then it's on the back. I just have to say um, uh, that we've been using Enscape with great success in, awesome. our, in our firm. Uh, we've helped clients um, even go through fundraiser um, oh, wow. and uh, has been unbelievable. So the only thing that I find uh, difficult with, with Enscape is the photorealism is beautiful and, and it's hard to go back to non-photorealism. Uh, but at the same time, you cannot have that interoperability like you were t saying earlier. Um, once you bake that, you can't, you can't do anything. Once you bake it, right. And, and if you don't bake it, then you have to take the Revit model to a presentation, which is not even practical. Uh, so what do you suggest, or uh, should we go to, to Fuser? Or I mean, Fuser does not have the same quality, but uh, it looks like it has all that capability that you can be with your headset and actually touch things and change stuff. Or um, what do you suggest we do? <sighs> That's a really hard question because it is a really it's like it really d does depend on what you want to get out of it. Um, you want to do it all. Basically. You want to do it all, right? And the client wants to do it all, and they don't want to have to pay you for it, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> no, but yeah, really, there's not a lot of cost in it. In, in, you know, we're modeling, and it goes straight from Revit to. Yep. To yeah. So it's, it's actually quite efficient. Yeah, it's the software cost, cost, and the hardware to run it. and That's basically it. Um, <laughs> It comes down to managing your clients with the environment. Yeah, you don't get the bi-directional when you bake it out. You can bake it out of Fuser as well. Um, it becomes an .exe file. But if you manage a client and you, you can use that as a essentially timeline of development for their project, and that's how I would kind of go about it personally. You know, if you like the visual fidelity that Enscape has, yeah. keep using Enscape. If you want some of the extra tools that Fuser provides, 
you know, experiment with Fuser and see what really works for you. you know, there's nothing that says you can't use both because they, they all push back and work off of Revit. So at the end of the day, you can be developing in Fuser, you know, getting people in there, designing, doing some extra stuff, and then do your final visualization because you want the Enscape look to it. So like I said, it's not that, it's not that expensive. You can get into it. So I think it's really cool, once you're done with a project, to have a lineage of your models and be able to walk through your models with the client to show them the development of the project in virtual reality, not just on paper, not just on the screen. I think that's a really cool technique. And I think you'll have great success if you kind of manage it as that. Say, this is a snapshot. This is a snapshot. And then when you see things going on between them where, you know, oh, well, we thought you were going to do this, you have that history. You don't need to overwrite them. You don't need to get them get, have them get rid of it. But you can actually create an experience so they can relive that process and then hopefully share it out with their colleagues. And their colleagues will want to pay you to do virtual reality on their project. <laughs> that's, that's the point, right? We got to get it paid for it and we have to have fun with it. And if they share it, you get more people interested, more people having fun. It's amazing. That, that kind of help, hopefully, yeah, a little bit? It did. It did. I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to keep asking. <laughs> well, you have my contact information, so feel free to email me, everybody here. Uh, reach out to me, ask questions. I'm always open to help out. How you doing? How you doing? I'm a mechanical engineer working on a project recently where the client wanted to see one of our plant rooms. And so what we ended up doing was exporting an IFC from Revit, opening it up in Solubi, which is a 3D viewer, and just sort of walking through the model that way. How do these programs that you mentioned earlier compare in, ter in terms of workflow as far as exports are concerned? Do you have to prepare the model differently, or is it equally similar and simple? Um, so you, in your current workflow, you do everything in Revit, and you have to ac actually export it, right? And Correct. then insert it and then load it into another, pro into another software platform. That's right. And go about that. Fuser and Enscape, I click a button. Really? And it launches Enscape or it launches Fuser. Your models are there. You don't have to rework on it. You can, I'm assuming, and this is a big assumption, uh, that you guys have possibly you know, clearance boxes around a lot of your equipment that Definitely. you can toggle on and off because it's all parameters that's saved in that data. Mm -hmm. So you could show them that space with that toggled off, and you can turn it on and show that space with their clearances toggled on and show, hey, look, this is getting really tight here. Look, look how small your clearance is. That's so awesome. it doesn't actually require any extra work. It's a click of a button. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. This is a really quick question. How do you manage poly counts in things like furniture, trees, yep. without making them look really choppy and nasty? Yep. Um, so how, how I like to manage poly counts in things like furniture, especially, is I like to have two versions of it, at least. I like to have my version in Revit, which you know, may only be a, it may be a 3D object, but that 3D object's not on in plan. It's a 2D representation and then put, it, the, put it, the high-end modeled asset on a work set that I can toggle on when I want to go into virtual reality. This way it doesn't bog down your, your files. It does require more work for you guys setting up on the back end, obviously, but it, when you develop these models and you have them, you want to use them. So you can go and develop, you know, let's say you're doing a bed. You can go and you can have the Revit bed. Or you can go into Max and you can, put a, you can have a pillow fall in it with gravity everything correct, so it actually folds the way it's going to fold when it's laying on the bed. And you can save that and insert that as your high-end asset and just toggle it on when you're ready to go to VR and toggle the other off. Trees and stuff like that. Vegetation, I don't like putting in Revit because I, I, just, I think it's horrible. Um, most software, I find, has their own assets for things like trees. So Fuser has their own trees, their own, their own entourage, if you will. Uh, you can put people in it, you can put cars in it. This way you don't have to put a bunch of cars in your Revit model to make them seem like you have entourage in your VR model. Um, we've used Lumion just for 2D, and they have their own giant tree library. So I would, depending on the software you're using to do your virtual reality in, chances are they have an entourage component that you can use that's actually optimized to run for VR in there without slowing your models down. Is there any, anything that you do, supposing you find a, a piece of furniture or something that is fantastic, but it has a wild, um, wildly high poly count? Is there anything you do to manipulate that and to make it a little more manageable? Um, depending on what it is and how much time it would actually take to manipulate it, to, uh, to keep it in documentation, let's say, 
we'll probably just rebuild it for the needs that we have because we're going to open it up. We're going to look at it. We're going to strip out some parameters we don't want, and we're going to put parameters in there that we do want. We do, you know, reporting and stuff off of our furniture with custom parameters. So we look at it anyway. So we actually have kind of approved content, and then the, we called it the Wild West in Avail, and it's the kind of it's literally a Wild West. Everybody's a cowboy. You, you know, don't look for me if it breaks your project. I'll help you fix it, but. I'd rather use my approved content or say, hey, I want to use this. Can you look at it for me and clean it up? And then I'll do that. And then we'll make it approved. Uh, you could also use, uh, like through Avail, we do that a lot. People are constantly downloading families and putting them in the Wild West. Google Analytics to see what our most used families are. So we'll also proactively go and clean those up and clean up the poly counts on them and just make them better for our users. All right, thank you. Yep, no problem. Oh, I'm short. Um, I also do healthcare, and an internal discussion we've had is what do you see the market going for? Because all of Stingray, Enscape, they're all deployable games versus a full headset experience, and we have an internal argument over what our customers really want and if a deployable game is really ultimately where it's going because that's most clients don't have a headset. They don't have that set up where they're going. So I don't know if you have any insight yep, to that. Um so where it's going, where I see it going, I believe this is the track that it's going to go with. I'm also a firm believer of, believer of virtual reality, not meaning you're in a headset, but it's actually the environment that you're creating. You can still show and help them feel presence off of a screen, depending on how you model things. So you know, if you only have a screen or client only has a screen, are they going to get the same feeling? Not, not as strong, probably. Let's be honest, it's not going to be as strong. But we, we try and talk people into getting into it and kind of use it, you know, as like, hey, the first time, maybe it's like we, we're experimenting with it internally anyway because we're designing in it. Like, if you're designing in it and you have it, you might as well let the client see it. Let, like, ha invite them not to a formal meeting, but do like a working session with them where they can see you in it working and then give them the chance to experience it if they want to and kind of work them into it. Um, we do have some clients asking for VR. You know, and it's really cool when you don't have to bring it up. You're like, yeah, you, you could say, yeah, you know, we could offer you like a VR environment. Or you could have them come to you and say, hey, I really want you to do this. You think you can do it? And that's always a much cooler feeling of your client being proactive and wanting to use an emerging technology, emerging since it's been around since like 1980, isn't really emerging anymore, but it's making a reemergence, I guess. But having the client ask you to do it and just getting them in that mindset by showing them working sessions rather than necessarily a polished thing so they're not worried about spending all this money on something that they're not going to use, they're not going to like. If you're using it to work, show it to them. Let them see what it can do. Make, let them see how it makes them feel because there's chances they have people that they still need to convince on their side. And they might say, I, I'm going to be able to convince them by putting them in here for five minutes and that might sell the project for them and make it easier for them, which makes it easier for you. Still got like 10 minutes, anybody have anything else? We got another one come up, cool. So I've got two questions. All um, right. First off, so I'm trying to get my company to get into VR and AR. What's some benefits? Because yeah, while the hardware and the software might not be expensive, the man time, the man hours to put into it, you know, I'm sure with every company, utilization is a big goal for everybody. So, yep. um, what's the selling point, basically? Yeah. What What can I do to sell to my own company to get into VR? So, what? Uh, just because I can, I can tell tell you about the architecture experience on it. Is the way we were able to sell it is you're able to give your client a better product at the end of the day. You get them to experience. You know, not every client can read plans, sections, elevations. They might you know, sign off on everything through it, get it built and be like, oh, that's what this looks like? I thought it was going to be much bigger. And really it's about selling it to your client and giving them the opportunity to get in the design process too. Getting them into their building before it's built, before you spend money on it, you know, mitigating change orders because they don't like a color of something because they didn't realize what it was going to look like fully in that space by a single rendered image, but they got a chance to experience it now. That's huge. And that, that's how I would go about selling it. We have because I kind of hijacked my own company. Can you, can you jump to the mic for that real quick? Do you 
you asked how you convince your own company right. to get, so the way I did it was interesting because we, we actually got Enscape first. Okay. Without goggles, without anything, right? And Enscape is cool because you can move through the Revit model. And I took it to a meeting, actually in a construction trailer. The client was there, one of our most important clients. The client flipped when, when, when uh, she saw that thing. She was like, oh my God, I love it. Can we go inside the model? And we couldn't at the time. We didn't have VR. And I lied. I said, yeah, we can go inside the model. <laughs> and then I came back to my office and I told the partners, we need to buy this thing now because Angela wants this. They're like, really? Like, yeah, uh, okay, how much is that? And then we bought it. It took a, a week. We ordered it. We, we were in VR. So yeah. that's, that was our... Yeah, that, that's an awesome, that's an, that is an awesome experience right there to have. I can tell you that. That's amazing. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much. Very much. Um, so in kind of this stepping process, I've kind of taken it upon myself to kind of get into the maybe mobile VR, so the Google Daydream. Yep. Um, just, I just quickly downloaded the uh, Fuser mobile app. Is that probably the best way to go, you know, in my spare time to go from a Revit to a mobile VR experience? So if you're using Fuser already, yeah, it's a great way to go. Okay. I, I, don't, I actually haven't had a chance to play with like web VR or Google Daydream that much. Um, there's been a few talks this week about it and it looks amazing. I'm really excited to get into it. But basically what you're able to do if you're using Fuser and you're working in that environment anyway, just a click of a button and it exports the, I believe it's an FZM file, a Fuser mobile file. And then you can load it onto your phone and just view it. Okay. And it takes touch controls as well as gyroscopic controls if you have it in a headset. Right, yeah. It, uh, so the Daydream has the headset and the, the little uh, joystick. Yep. And they've recent, or they're getting ready to update it where you can pair a second um, joystick with it. Oh, awesome. So you can get the dual experience of flying around or yep. uh, and stuff like that. So, yeah, thank you. Awesome. I told you I was going to learn something from you guys today. I did not know that. That's sweet. And then thank you for also for stepping in and kind of giving us your experience there. That's, I really like having the possibility for everybody to talk and share their experiences because I just had my experiences. I don't know what you guys have done. You might have a, you might have a tip or a trick that you've done that might help us and help everybody else. That's amazing. Uh, still got some minutes. You got some time? Awesome. This is more like a, a comment than more than, than a question. Um, my experience has been to involve your client into the design process and whenever you have a chance to have them you know, participate in that exercise, uh, when they make a decision on something, believe it, that thing is not going to be VE'd out and it's staying in the project. So it, it's just a comment out there. You know, and it's true. You know, if you can involve your client, that's awesome. I wouldn't I wouldn't just send your client like a, an executable file and let them go crazy without you having like given them a tour of what you're going to send them first, get them f comfortable with it. The first time you send them something, be like, yeah, try it here because they probably don't have a headset or a computer that can run it. Um, they have a phone, obviously, hopefully a smartphone. Um, but you know, even if it's just an EXC and they can kind of play around with it on the computer and you know, have an experience like yours did where they saw it and they're like, I want to go in it. And you know, just giving them that chance and it allows you to involve them within the design process, which means they're probably going to get a better product, which means you're probably going to get more work with them. Anything else, guys? Uh, you put an emphasis on space and experience for your client. Yep. Uh, can you suggest three games for the audience to play to work on the experience and the ambience? If you have played them. <laughs> yeah, so th three things really to kind of incorporate to, to work on the, those, those experiences and really make them pop. I, I would suggest the first time you try and get somebody to experience the space, don't have materials on have it spatial and have lighting. And preferably natural lighting, because artificial lighting, you can just move around. So you really want them to experience the space as if it was just built and you have no lighting, no materials, and just coming, rays coming in. That, that'd be the first one. The second one is build 
not just what you're trying to show them, build the environment around it. So if you're building a building that's on an existing site, you know, it could be a TI, let's say, you want to model the existing because you want them to feel what they're going to feel there in that building. If, you, if you're doing a tower, let's say, you put somebody up on the 20th floor and they look out and they just see nothing, what are they really getting? They're not going to experience what they're going to see when they're up on the 20th floor looking out over their site. And that, that's a different experience for them. So I would model the existing surrounding conditions to a degree at least. And it could be, you know, like in the tower situation, it could be just white boxes around to show massing of other buildings and other major elements at least going on. So that's two. Um, so that's kind of going from your abstract first time, getting them into the space, kind of what you can do surrounding your model to get them to feel more like they're connected with the site. The third one would be really pay attention to your assets, I guess. So this table. Now, if we modeled out this room, and we can put you all in chairs in virtual reality, and I could be doing this presentation, this table could just have like a flat down curtain on it or tablecloth on it, and it, it, would just, it would look horrible, right? But by having the wave in it, having some reflection, adding texture to that for that, even, even if you don't add the material itself, but you have just the wave, it, those small, subtle cues make a world of the difference. Another good example is, this is for, you know, still images as well as VR, you have a transition between concrete and carpet. Is your carpet flush with your concrete or is it raised up a little bit? If it's raised up, do you have a metal edge there? or What do you have? Those little things that you don't necessarily think of as anything major can just make the person perceive it as it's more of a realistic space and feel the space a little bit better. So modeling in things like that. You provide context. Yes. What's been your success with taking like a headset and taking it mobily to a client? We use Inkscape right now. We have a, a souped up laptop like you do, but it doesn't run the Oculus version of it. Really? So yeah, we, we got it when uh, we got the DK2 for Oculus. It worked for that. And then as soon as they came out with the actual commercial version, it yep. didn't work anymore. So have you found that Fuser works better for a headset, less processing power? Um, I would probably just buy a new computer. <laughs> I mean, if you, had a, if you had a DK2 and you're running the same laptop, I know graphics cards have gone, what, three steps up since then. Mm -hmm. So this computer has a 1070 with six gigs of RAM in it of, of just the graphics card. So that right there helps. I run the Vive with Fuser, Enscape, Unreal, 3S Interactive, you name it, any video games off of this computer in VR, and it runs fine. Um, Bringing it to a client, that's, that's always a hard one. Do you have a computer like this to bring, or do you? Yeah. I, actually, I actually would prefer, I think, to have them come to my art, like your space. Yeah, which Because you can set the setting. What, what was that? Sorry. That's kind of hit or miss, depending on where the client is. It is. Um, another thing would be, as you start seeing these kind of pop-ups for like shared working communities, the hard part is going to a client's house, essentially, right? You're, you're going into their space, mm -hmm. and you're going to remove all their furniture and you're gonna set the room up, so it just takes so much time. So if you can find a space to get into early and set up, that's really what does it. If you don't have that chance, getting a, you know, a, a higher end, newer laptop, uh, they come in, I think you have 1080s in them now, and maybe not providing the full VR experience where you're actually walking around, but providing a kind of lower where they're able to sit in the chair, still teleport around, so it's kind of like a static VR experience, but they're still able to move around, look around, and do things mm -hmm. is a possibility. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, we actually have 49 seconds left, so. Thank you for the questions, guys. That was awesome. <laughs> So thanks for coming once again. Like I said, give me a follow online, shoot me an email, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, whatever it is, and I'd love to talk more with you.